All right, good morning and welcome to Friday Chalk Talk. Today we are joined by Florence Moss and Kate McKillop, who are here to share some additional insights into their recent publication in the Journal of Pain and Symptom Management. And it's titled Power, Silence, and Debriefing Hidden Harms When Palliative Teams Encounter Racism. They put into paper what so many of us have witnessed, and we are very grateful to them for sharing this experience. And I think this topic of racism is even more additionally complex in the field of palliative care and chaplaincy, because we're not only having to actively confront these behaviors, but we're trying to do so in a way that also attempts to build bridges and really acknowledges that in order for us to do our jobs, in order for us to physically, spiritually heal our patients, we have to have some rapport, and that's not an easy task. And so the format for today is going to be two parts. Uh, Flo, Kate, and I have several questions that we've agreed to discuss, and then we will leave some time at the end for questions or thoughts or shared experiences. Uh, so Flo and Kate, thank you for being here with us today. And maybe you can start us off by sharing a little bit about yourselves and your role in palliative care and chaplaincy when the event occurred, and then how you've seen this topic of power and silence and racism exist in your fields. Flo, you want to start us off? Okay, I'll start. Well, good morning, everyone. My name is um, Florence. I go by Flomo Moss. Um, I am a, I am a, let's see, <laughs> I'm an army chaplain uh, and I have been a reservist for more than 25 years, but this experience was captured in my civilian capacity. So I'll be sharing from that lens. Um, as far as, oh, uh, how I, the question was, how do I see this experience showing up? We see it in our nation as a whole. And as chaplains, we care for people who may be in some of their most vulnerable times and um, having the courage to push through and ask the tough questions or to engage a process even after you've been hurt and allow yourself and your team to grow is where maturity and I also feel like an enriching professional space is cultivated. And so I am delighted to share uh, from a place where I felt I was in my most broken time. It was very challenging being in Nebraska. I'm from Miami, live, and I currently live in the Pacific Northwest and in between near DC and California. So you can only imagine only living in large metropolitan areas and then going through one of the most vulnerable educational experiences in the Midwest. Definitely offered a lot of challenges, but also as we see throughout this article, a great opportunity for growth as an individual and also helping my fellow, you know, peers in industries, professional industries. So I'm looking forward to sharing with you all today. I found in this experience that I really hadn't grappled with my responsibility as an educator to my learners. And um, I would say in answer to that question of how I've seen this topic of, of power and silence and racism, for me, not only as a palliative clinician, but as an educator, as somebody who has learners um, as, as a vulnerable population with me, I've really been more conscious and mindful of how can I make the space of our clinical encounters and of our learning safe and accommodating. And um, that's been an ongoing process for me as well. Yeah. I, I think that is a great segue, perhaps even into our second question, because before I read your article, I don't know that I had words or at least something to practice for, for how to address some of these things. And table two, as we have up here, this really is what drew me to your guys' paper. It's, it's powerful. It gives you tangible phrases. Um, and some of, these, some of these phrases really sp speak to, I think, us me in particular in palliative care, because we see similarities here about how do we address things like high emotion, like the first one, 
right? Help me understand. You tried to confront somebody with love, hoping that by their understanding, you might be able to cause some change. <clears throat> some of the other options here, they feel a little bit different, but may have a different role to play as well. And so I'm curious from your guys' perspective, have you tried any of these? How have they worked? How have people responded? Would, would you change any of these things? Would the table look any different now, now that the event is probably a little bit more than a year away? So I'm grateful to say that there has not been this an egregious of a um, sentinel event occur in my presence since we wrote this article. I think this event goes so much further beyond a microaggression. This was, this was a big thing. And um, I've been, for a long time, I was very almost hyper vigilant and thinking like I was like practicing these things to myself and um, I still am because I, I think that as a white person I haven't had to live the experience that Flo has had to and I owe it to my colleagues to maintain that same level of vigilance and um being prepared to affirm and uphold my colleagues is, in my estimation, just part of my standard professional medical practice at this point. Um, we did practice this as a team. Hmm. We're a, a, to give you a little bit of context, I practice in a, um, uh, academic medical center that's a clinical affiliate for a university, but our palliative care team is across five of the campuses. So much more of a community medicine feel for our team in general and um, limited experience with learners for several of my colleagues. And um, Omaha is quite a segregated city. So there are some hospitals that we serve where race is a powerful dynamic in the clinical encounter. And there are others that are very white. Um, we have a diverse clinical um, healthcare team, um, diverse in a lot of ways. And um, one thing that I've noticed is um, patients making statements that they can't understand or they're not sure of like where their clinician came from and sort of, um, disparaging remarks. And so one practice that I've gotten into is just affirming how excellent Dr. So-and-so is or how like that side of things. Um, other ways that we've practiced. Oh, I was going to say, so when we, when we walked through this article as a team and I said, you guys, people are going to say really hurtful things in your presence. I want you to be able to practice a way to respond that doesn't destroy the relationship that we're building with this family, but also doesn't destroy the lived experience of the most marginalized person there. And several of our colleagues felt like that last statement was the most accessible to them. I don't know if it's because it's a question it feels a little more gentle, um, but several of our, our team members felt like that was something that they could build into their practice. Whereas setting those clear boundaries, some of the middle ones, please don't use that word in my presence, that term is unacceptable here, felt too aggressive to some of our colleagues. I think it probably depends on the situation that you're facing. Yeah. Um, and your, your experience and level of preparedness and, and vigilance for the aggression. Thank you. Can I, I'd like to just add to that in saying that I think for me, being that I am from a large metropolitan area, the tough question is not really that tough because it's something that is built into our normal day practice. 
-hmm. you know, and I saw, you know, at the time how in my experience in Nebraska, there was a challenge sometimes addressing the pink elephant in the room, you know, mm -hmm. and I'm like, so we just not going to address the fact that this just happened, <laughs> you know, gotcha. um, having those conversations is just built into the lived experience of growing up in a Caribbean or Latin American culture, such as South Florida. So that wasn't a challenge. The challenge for me most was having that awareness and the language to address, mm -hmm. you know, conflict with points of views in a space where the term Nebraska nice was the heartbeats and how you move throughout the Midwest. Mm. So for me, it was modulating my awareness and my, I almost say boldness, because some people can see that, but modulating it like the courage to actually address what's really happening. You know, growing up, I always was taught, recognize the problem and then work on a solution to it. So when problems present themselves, to delay addressing it means that you are empowering it for an extended time when you can just nip it in the bud quickly by just addressing it directly and move forward, you know, so. Well said. And you, you think that as palliative care clinicians, we would be uniquely poised to do this because our, our job is to point out the elephants in the room, but I don't think that we're prepared to address every elephant. And, and maybe it depends upon where we're from. Absolutely, yeah. Do you guys believe that there are any exceptions to this, where there are certain scenarios where we shouldn't be calling these things out, shouldn't be trying to um, confront these behaviors? Seek to understand. That's one of the things I definitely have grown to um, embrace in my practice mm -hmm. as a chaplain since starting my journey in clinical pastoral education is having a posture to seek to understand. So simply asking things like, what do you mean by that? Like allow the space for people to um, expound upon their little nuances that may feel off kiltered in a room. Sure. You know, to, to, to not do so does an injustice to yourself as well as others in that space. A thing is a thing. It's okay that it's there, but understand how you're going to navigate with that thing being in the room. Yeah. I find myself, I have a phrase that I have leaned on quite a bit recently, and that is to say, this is a difficult situation. Um, and most of that's to remind myself that there's no such thing as a difficult patient or a difficult family. <laughs> but this is a difficult situation, and that is just perhaps naming where we are and then following up with a statement of support for whoever is most powerless in that moment. Dr. So-and-so is doing a great job taking care of you. Lindy is doing a great job taking care of you or something to that effect. Um, and I don't, it, it has been, um, and then an alignment statement of something like, we all want what's best for you and your loved one. Help, help us help you or something to that effect has been um, helpful in, in diffusing difficult situations for me recently. Yeah. yeah the more I've thought about this question, the more I feel the same way. The, you, it, it should be talked about. And there's... Um, when it comes to anything difficult like a virtue like courage it takes repetition too so every time that you don't address it it becomes even more difficult mm -hmm. and so uh, I, I i feel the same way i think where i've struggled with addressing this in the past is at end of life i i have had a few cases where i've had patients who are alone no family no one talking to me we have some rapport. Maybe I'm one of the few people they have any rapport with, and we're we're going to withdraw a, a ventilator from them. And I've had a few share some really hateful things about everything and everybody other than them. And um, that that I think is where I've struggled the most because I know that their hate is going to die, and it did. It died with them when we removed the ventilator. And I, I wondered what was I going to accomplish here. Um, but even still, as I look back, maybe, maybe there was still something to be gained, if even within me, if even within modeling for my team, 
that kind of behavior. Yeah. Um, we have about five more minutes. So we'll, I'll ask you one more question and before we open it up to the group. Um, is there anything that you edited out of this paper that didn't make it in that you think is worth mentioning now? So I would, I, I have to commend Flo for <laughs> writing some of the most powerful and profound words that I've encountered. The word silence, the silence is deafening, just resonate with me. And I will never forget those words. And she crafted a challenging and worthwhile and evocative um, capstone reflection paper called, I think it's when the palliative chaplain becomes the palliative patient, mm -hmm. that close enough? At resident to palliative care patient. Yes, and she was not given credit for the palliative care specialization unit because it was felt that this was um, not meeting the academic requirements of the, the paper assignment. And I think that is a reflection that um, there is this paper is about the individual's work in dismantling racism, but there is much work still to be done on an institutional level to dismantle what is a problematic and colonial approach to academia. Her words had value and were not given that value. Thank you. And that wrinkles me to this day. So it, we felt that it wasn't, that there was, I don't know, when maybe we should have put that in the paper. Yeah, we referenced it in the paper, but yeah, it hasn't been shared anywhere other than when I presented it. You're correct. Thank you for saying that. I appreciate it. I think, I think that we were honest as honest can be for the moment and what we presented to the world. And, you know, <laughs> I tell Kate all the time, I say, Kate, and this is before we uh, publish this um, piece. I was like, I can see you influencing a generation. I see you shifting the cultural conversation. Little did I know that we would end up writing this article and get it published um, at the time that I would affirm her in that space. But one of the things that Kate does well is she's very reflective and intentional in how she engage and builds. You know, and we we sat, we had coffee talk. You know, we do a lot of coffee talks. You know, on so many other areas, but we allow coffee to be an intricate tool to engaging one another. It de-escalated a tense situation, and she did a great job of building us back up. Not even building us back up but building us to a place where we can be unified in speaking honestly and openly. That's one of the things I'm noticing a lot of times. People are afraid to speak open and honest, you know? And that's what I hope will, will be sparked moving forward. People have courage to address each other with courtesy. However, you know what I mean? Be transparent, you know? I'm almost about to quote a scripture, you know, the truth will set you free. I'll just paraphrase it. You know what I mean? And so just lean into that. So that's what I want to just say on the end of that. You know, I'm a Baptist minister, so I can go a little bit longer. I'm just trying to slow it down. <laughs> All right. Thank you guys so much. I will open the floor. Um, if anybody has a question, an experience, uh, anything, please unmute. Uh, yeah, this is Tim Earhart, um, and I actually have a, a verse from the biblical Psalms that was kind of rattling in my head as you guys were talking that says, when I kept silent, my bones wasted away. Um, and, I, and I have uh, two questions. One is, 
did you in that experience did you guys look at each other and did you see um, each other's bones wasting away in other words what you know what was what was your affect what were what were the physical clues going on there um and and i'm also kind of curious because it sounds like you had a good debrief once you were out of the room um could that um debrief could that debrief could it happen in the room in the presence of the patient or not I was just, oh, go ahead, Flo. I was just gonna say that that was one of the things we talked about, like how the fact that it's great that we can recognize it and talk about it now. It would have been better had it been spoken about in the room. So immediately we recognize that we missed an opportunity, but that's how we got to this place now so that we can have a tool so that moving forward, we won't be caught like a deer in a headlight situation. I saw a quote recently on Twitter, and I wish I could remember who said it, but that white supremacy is not the shark, it is the water. And I think this was a, a wake up call to me that I was so fixated on the emotional and facial expression and trying to understand I was, I was in mode of trying to understand what had happened. I wasn't doing due diligence to mitigating a traumatic experience. And so I think the tell me more impulse that we have in palliative care, we need to know when to balance that with a, hey, this is unacceptable. Flo is a great, Reverend Moss is a great chaplain. I'm sorry, you're gonna be missing out on her care. Um, in terms of like what that moment was like, I remember his smile was really confusing to me. And I remember pulling, I remember Flo telling me after the fact that everybody in the room physically leaned back where we had been leaning forward. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it was just a, a moment of profound shock and uncertainty and unpreparedness. Great question. Gary, I see you unmuted. Uh, yes, I, I, I know I speak for everyone, but first and foremost, uh, thank you for the article. I was familiar with it and thank you for the discussion today. Um, as, as you talked, and, and I, I just wanna mention this as a comment, it was um, somewhat reminiscent, not close parallel with the book after whiteness that I was, um, most of the people in this group know that I co-facilitated a, a CPA unit, um, but I, I just wanted to mention that. But my specific question is, and it's truly a question, um, what was the age and the maturity of the palliative care team in terms of how long had you been functioning as a team and I guess as the follow-up question to that is, um, in, until you encounter something, to use the term, and I agree, this egregious, um, was it something that was on the radar or were you a fairly new team, if any of that makes sense? I was in my second or third year of independent practice. We had a nurse who was in her, she's been a nurse for us for seven to 10 years, um, but was an ICU nurse for long before that. And then we had a fourth year medical student. And then was this your third unit, Flo? I think so. Mm -hmm. yes. So you were in your six to nine months in the hospital setting. Yes, it, when this happened. It, it may be obvious um, why I asked those questions because I'm in Missouri, obviously the Midwest and Flo, what you said, yes. And um, I wish I could say that, yeah, this has never happened. And I, my own experience, I'm just sharing with the group is that um, proactive and again, conversations like this help, but 
yes, uh, maybe the first couple times there's a learning curve about what do we do, but this kind of dialogue is that it needs to be <laughs> addressed in a constructive, um, respectful manner, or as Marty and, and you all have said, it will be worse. Uh, it will continue to fester. Uh, and the biblical quote, which I'm not good, is, is absolutely right. It will, it will eat away not only your bones, but the team and effectiveness, I think. Hey, this is Leanne Lau, um, and I apologize, my camera is not working, but uh, there, there's an interesting dynamic here, though, that I do think is is worth mentioning. I think it, it begs the question of where's the line that Marty was sort of mentioning of, gosh, if the patient's acutely dying, is there really an opportunity to make a change there, right, versus somebody who's not acutely dying with the extubation? And, and I guess when, when, when I'm listening to this and hearing the discussion, I guess the, the question comes is actually who is the most vulnerable person in the room at the time and who does hold the power? And I think that's what gets interesting because, and, and by the way, too, I just want to say this is a great discussion and I applaud you both for being so willing to talk about a really, really hard thing because I think it's, it's really tricky. Um, but the, you know, the son obviously is not the dying patient, right? And so there is an opportunity there, but if the patient had said it, gosh, you know, I do question how much of the, the pushback should be against a patient expressing an opinion. And is it more the opinion that she's expressing versus the words that are used? Like, which is the thing that we should focus on if we're going to pick something and, how do we decide who is actually the most vulnerable person? You know, is it the person that's being picked on is not the word I want, but that's the only one that's coming to mind right now. Is it flow or is it still the patient? And how do you, how do you decide that in the moment? And I think that is the really, the really tricky thing for when you have to stand up. And I think in this case, of course, the actual word that was used is, is terribly offensive. If it had been framed differently, um, you know, I can tell you over my career, I've had plenty of times where I've been told, I don't want you because you're a woman. I don't want you because you're too young. I don't want you because of X, Y, and Z. Mm -hmm. And I think patients do have a right to those preferences that we do have to be cognizant of. And, and again, in this case, what bothers me on all levels is the whole thing. But again, it's the, it's the word I think that you have to, to really address because people still do have the right to their present, to their preferences. And I don't think we can as the palliative care team, I don't think we can fix that. As societal members, as people out in the world, we can, but our job as the palliative care team is not to, and I'm putting this in air quotes, to fix the opinion of our patient. That's not what we're there for. And so I, I do really struggle with that, but I think the support for the team is essential. And Flo, I'm hoping that you can give some feedback to me for that whole opinion, because I I can really feel in my mind that there's probably some cringeworthiness to what I've just said, but at the same time, it's, it's really truly a struggle for where, where the power lies and who actually is the most, you know, the, the most vulnerable person in the room at the time. Okay. Yes. Thank you for your question. Um, well, I hear you when you say the cringeworthiness of it. Um, I want to say that word because I don't want to forget that. But we have to be honest with the fact that we live in America and there is always a, when we enter a room, a cultural um, dynamic that dictates the heartbeat of the power dynamic. It's just the way America is set up. And to not go into a space and recognize that it exists is doing an injustice to the technical work. So we have technical and tactical work that we're bringing to the forefront. And so with the technical details of who you are as a palliative care provider, understanding the cultural, the socioeconomic, the other things that are in that space that's informing how it is going to um, have that relationship build and if your patient is gonna be honest with you. So when you, when you say that it's a little cringeworthy, yes, it is. As a black woman in America, I live in the cringe all day. <laughs> you know, I push through the cringe. The cringe is uncomfortable. 
but and when so I wanted to clarify my I meant what I was saying right now is cringeworthy not anything oh. your, that my comments are cringeworthy that's what I was referring to specifically <laughs> oh, got you, no problem but I hear what you're saying yeah I, thank you for the clarification by the way um but yes, having an honest awareness with, with yourself and your team of those other aspects that informs the conversation in the room. There's a lot of silence that is moving the dialogue. But if you, it's imperative to make certain that you are honest with that. And when you're honest with that, that power di dynamic that you were inquiring about will, um, it, it'll show itself real fast. You know, I'm thinking about a time when we were with a patient and we went to care for a palliative patient that um, the mother was very alert and astute. And you see this in a lot in a lot of um, Caribbean families you may come, come in contact with. You will think that whoever is the oldest child um, will be the person that is necessarily the one you go to for a lot of um, addressing needs and follow up and stuff like that. A lot of time, no, a lot of people think it's the male child. It's usually the oldest child. There you go. So a lot of times people walk into a room and I've seen this sitting in the back and they'll walk to the male child that's in the room thinking that the male child of the patient is the go-getter, the person to check the dot, the I cross T. And a lot of times that's not the case. It's usually the oldest, whoever is the oldest one. So even though there's a male that's present, go to the oldest one. It's again, back to that cultural thing we were talking about. So having that in the, in the room with you, because it doesn't cut off in America, that addresses the power the, the power dynamics, the differential that you were speaking of. Am I addressing your question clearly? Because that's what I heard, you know, trying to understand who is the power player in that space and how do you engage it? Well, and I guess more just recognizing that even in that situation where you were clearly having derogatory comments pointed your way. The question that I have, I guess, is actually in that situation, who has more power, you as a caregiver or the patient, who's, who's more vulnerable there? And, and I guess that's, to, and, I, and I guess I feel like that's sort of maybe where you make the decision for whether or not it gets addressed in the room versus outside mm -hmm. the room. Um, and I, I think that's really a struggle because, I, you know, it, there is still, the team does have power regardless of the marginalization of certain members of the team they're still part of the team and so I, I guess that's just it's a struggle that I can see and I've had some you know less blatant examples that I can think of in my life where I've felt like it's better to not to not force the patient to address that again with the idea that you know in 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 a different setting not a patient somebody else saying the same word I think it's or the same phrasing, or even the you know less egregious, whatever. I think it has to be addressed. But in that dynamic where it's a patient, I don't I don't call my patient out on every single thing that they express that I don't agree with culturally, medically, so, you know all these things. We don't. That's not our. That's not where we are. And so I, I guess I'm just struggling with how to decide when to address it in the room versus as a team. And I think that power, this this idea of thinking about who is powerful and who is powerless in a situation can definitely be a both and. We have a patient right now who is incapacitated and unrepresented with a temporary guardian and has, I think, burned a lot of bridges in their life. And they are um, really misogynistic. And every time we go in there, ask us to show them their, our breasts. And our response is, you're safe we can't do that. We are taking good care of you. So recognize that this person is incredibly vulnerable from a medical and a practical and a functional standpoint, and that he deserves our, our compassion and our care and to set clear limits to say that when somebody is asked to show you, show them your breasts, that's a microaggression and we can we can set limits and care for ourselves in that same moment. I think it can be a bold end. Well, thank you guys both. I'm sure that we could continue to talk about this for quite some time, but this is a short and sweet little intro, a taste. And I really appreciate 
you, Flo. I really appreciate you, Kate. Thank you so much for the article, for the conversation. Hope you guys have a wonderful rest of the weekend. I am so grateful that this um, was an act of vulnerability on our parts, I think. And we're just so grateful that conversation and change is, is occurring as a result of it. So thank you for hosting us.